Hello, third grade. Today we're going to look at chapter nine of Poppy. The vocab word we're going to work on today is confidence, and we'll see this in chapter nine. We're also going to notice the word desired in this paragraph when it talks about her greatest desire is to become a ballroom dancer. And this was previewed for the vocab when you did your journal in previous lesson. So chapter nine, on her way. Once past the rusty water pump, Poppy had to cross Old Orchard. Mr. Wilcox's permission was not required here. Even better, the grass was high among the old twisted apple trees, providing good camouflage. Here and there, delicate pink lady slippers bloomed. Berry bushes were heavy with fruit. Blue jays and jays and warblers flitted by. Grasshoppers leaped about joyfully. Oh my, oh my, Poppy murmured as she rested halfway across. It's too nice a day to be worried and sad. She was sitting beneath the shade of a snowberry berry bush, nibbling on succulent dandelion stem. Above, only a high, few high-flying clouds floated in the blue sky. The graceful drift of clouds reminded Poppy of her secret desire, something she had never told anyone, not even ragweed. She suspected he would have teased her. Once, when in, up in the gray house attic, chewing through some old magazines, she had come upon pictures of an old ballroom dancing team of Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire. Here the couple dipped, there they soared, here they spun, Poppy was enraptured. From that moment on, her greatest desire was to be a ballroom dancer. Oh, to glide effortlessly across the floor in the arms of a handsome mouse. And if you guys remind me next week, we'll watch a YouTube video of them dancing. If you remind me. Forgetting everything for a moment, Poppy plucked a pair of lady slippers and fitted them to her feet. How cool, how soft and delicate they were. Delicate they were, as if someone were kissing her toes. She jumped up, lifted her arms, flexed her paws elegantly. She hopped, leaned her head back, fluttered her, her eyes, and twirled about just as in the pictures. Round and around she spun. Suddenly, as if a voice actually whispered in her ear, Poppy recalled something sweet Cicely had told her many times that the only, the only live mouse is an alert mouse. Feeling alarmed and embarrassed, Poppy promptly, promptly kicked off the lady's slippers, scampered beneath the protection of some stinkweed, and scanned the skies. Yet she must keep on guard, even though Mr. Wilcox was probably sound asleep. Mr. Wilcox was not asleep. He was flying over the marsh in the direction of Bannock Hill. Though working daylight hours displeased him, he was convinced it was necessary. Ever since Lungwort had requested permission to move some of the mice, mouse family to Newhouse, Mr. Oakcox had been uneasy. He kept wondering about the mice. Had they discovered what he had discovered? Did they know something he did not? He knew the reason they gave the moving he knew the reason they gave for moving to Newhouse, but were they telling the truth? Then there was Lungworth's daughter Poppy, who had escaped him twice. The effrontery. How had she done it? The owl kept asking himself, Did she possess special skills? Why had Lungworth brought her to that meeting? Was it to mock him? Was she going to take over was she going to take over from the old fool? And why did this business of Newhouse and the matter of Poppy occur at the same time? Was it just a coincidence? Could there be a connection, a conspiracy? The more questions he asked, the more nervous the owl became. Whatever the truth, Mr. Ocox decided that he had to remain on alert sleep less, patrol more, as his mother used to tell him. 
An alert owl is a well-fed owl. So he's got a saying too. In particular, he must keep his eye open for that mouse, the one named Poppy. Scampering from bush to bush, Poppy soon reached the banks of Glitter Creek. There she stopped to gaze nervously at the far side and the towering trees of Dimwood Forest. Her first task, however, was to get over the water. At the spot where she stood, Glitter Creek was as wide as a length of Grey House. Usually the waters flowed with tranquility, but not now. Though the bright water was moving far less rapidly than on the night of the storm, the flow still rumbled, twisted, and foamed around the many rocks that stuck up from the rock bed. Poppy realized that she'd never be able to swim across. She could walk downstream and cross the bridge, but the bridge was situated exactly where Mr. Ocox had his watching tree the last spot she desired to revisit. So many painful memories. No, as Poppy saw it, the only way to get across the creek was by jumping from rock to rock. She climbed a tree stump for a better view and set about figuring a route. Though it took a while, she found a path that required 14 jumps. The only problem would be, would come on the ninth. On that rock, a turtle was sleeping. Even so, she thought she'd have enough room to make a quick landing and leap away. The turtle might not even notice. On the creek bank again, Poppy crouched, ready to take her first jump. Just as she was about to spring, she stopped. Once over the water, how could she return home? Even as she hesitated, a breeze fluttered Ragweed's earring. The tickle it brought reminded Poppy of the reason for her mission. Resolved anew, she gave a leap and landed deftly on the first of the rocks, then the second and the third. On she jumped, gaining confidence as she progressed. The eighth jump, however, required a pause. Her next leap would land on the turtle's rock, but because he had shifted position, there was no longer any room for her to land. So the turtle moved. Hey turtle, would you please move, Poppy shouted. The turtle slept on. In search of an alternative route, Poppy noticed a small low rock not far upstream. It was covered with moss. To reach it would require a difficult Though not impossible jump, she saw no other choice. When I first read that for the first time, I saw that, I'm thinking, oh, that's gonna be slippery. We'll see what happens. She saw no other choice. Poppy took a deep breath and kicked. Her leap was high and far enough. She landed right on a small rock, but unfortunately its moss was wet and slimy. The moment she hit it, her feet shot out from under her. A quick skid plopped her into and under the water. Spitting and coughing, Poppy clawed her way back to the surface. For an instant, she floated downstream. Then a wave picked her up and pinned her against another rock. Help, help, she cried. The next moment, another wave whisked her away. Mr. Ocox, gliding over Farmer Lamont's field, heard Poppy's call for help. From the west, wasn't it? He banked sharply and headed into the direction of Glitter Creek. Paddling furiously, Poppy shrugged, struggled to keep her nose above water. Despite her efforts, she was swept on. She spun downstream like a whirlwig. Whirl a gig. It's a kind of flower, I believe. Then abruptly, she felt herself wedged between two rocks. Water washed over her. As she gasped for air, she sensed that if she stayed put, it would only be a matter of time, a short time before she drowned. Wrenching one paw free, she groped for something to cling on to. What she found was the slimy root of water lily. She tried to hold on, the root slipped from her grasp. She reached out again and managed to find the lily's stem, snorting to keep nose, 
and mouth free of water, Poppy hauled in. Bit by bit, she began to rise. Something in the water of Glitter Creek caught Mr. Ocock's eyes. To his surprise, he saw a little mouse struggling with a water lily. Poppy worked frantically to pull herself higher. She was now only belly deep. With a few more pulls on the stem, she would be safe. Circling above, Mr. Ocox watched the mouse struggle to climb atop of the rock. The moment it reached it, he was prepared to dive. Poppy nearly had her footing on the rock when the lily stem snapped. Her balance lost. She tumbled back into the creek. The moment she struck the water, a wave pummeled her below the surface. Just as Mr. Ocox dived, the mouse he was watching suddenly dropped into the water. When it failed to reappear, he assumed the creature had drowned. His patience frazzled. He pumped his wings, rose on a gust of air, and turned towards Newhouse. A day had passed since he had been there. He needed to check it again. Poppy, desperate for air, bobbed to the surface like a cork. Once again, she was swept away. Her strength was ebbing desperately. She sought something to hold on to. She found nothing. Down the creek she went. Then the creek widened. The water grew less turbulent. Aware that this was probably the last chance she'd have to save herself, Poppy summoned her remaining strength and began to swim frantically. Slowly, painfully, she pulled free of the stream's main force. She bumped against a stone and ricocheted into a calm backwater. She stretched her toes down and touched bottom. Half crawling, half swimming, she clawed her way up the creek bank. When she reached the grass, she flung herself down, coughing violently. And I think everyone's had that experience in a pool or in the water. That moment you, your, toes, your toes touch the bottom, you all of a sudden become calm. I think everyone's experienced that before. For a long time, Poppy lay on her back, eyes closed, capable of only grasping breasts. Then she rolled over and threw up the last of the swallowed water. At last, she gave a shuddering groan of relief. <sighs> on the northern edge of Dimwood Forest, Mr. Wilcox found a branch that allowed him to observe Newhouse without being seen. From his perch, he looked past a dirt road, an old barn, a cornfield, a salt lick, and a lawn. What he sought was something else. Something he had saw on the new barn next to the house. When he saw it again, he gasped. It was still there. It must be living there. Whatever hopes he had evaporated. Poppy opened her eyes. Through her vision was blurry, she was able to gaze up at the sky, though the petals of the daisy, through the petals of the daisy. She was quite certain it was the most beautiful flower she had ever seen. Anxious to know where she landed, she sat up and looked about. Only then did she realize she'd come ashore near the bridge. And on the far side of the creek, feeling pleased with herself, she considered the nearby trees with pleasure. The next second, Poppy's pleasure vanished. She come ashore at the one spot in the whole world she wanted not to be, right next to Mr. Ocock's charred oak. That's it for chapter nine.